Will those fish heads and guts eliminate the need for any additional fertilizer when we plant something else here? What's up Lazy Dog fam? I hope all y'all are having a fantastic day. It is Friday, May 12th here in South Georgia. And today we're gonna talk about bad gardening advice and sometimes how good gardening advice can turn in to bad gardening advice. Now before we jump into this, let me be the first to say I'm guilty of giving some bad gardening advice over the years. And I think if you garden long enough and you try to help other people garden, you're probably going to do that at some point as you kind of figure things out for yourself. I've been guilty in the past of saying that it's tough, I may have even used the word impossible, to grow heavy feeding crops like onions, corn, cabbage without the use of synthetic fertilizers however i've since kind of changed my stance on that and i think we've demonstrated in the last few years that you can grow nice crops of corn onions cabbage just by using organic fertilizers so first i'll give you examples of just plain bad gardening advice and then we'll talk about how good gardening advice can become bad gardening advice and as far as bad gardening advice goes there's a lot of bad gardening advice out there on onions i see it every year all over social media people telling you to do the wrong things as far as how to grow onions now all of my onion growing strategies came from discussions i've had with bruce frazier over at dixondale farms over the years he's the og onion man he knows this stuff and basically everything I do as far as growing onions is based on things he has told me over the years. Now we don't grow his plants anymore. We grow our own plants from seeds, but he has given me a lot of really good gardening advice about onions over the years. That contradicts a lot of what you see out there as far as people telling you how to grow onions. So the first piece of bad gardening advice when it comes to onion, and I see this every single year, from many different people is saying that if you cut the tops on your onion plants like that, it's gonna make a bigger bulb down there. Nope, cutting those tops is not gonna make that bulb bigger. What cutting these tops is gonna do is allow water to get down in there when it rains and it's probably gonna make that onion rot or it will make it not store near as long. Also, going to open up the possibility for diseases and stuff to get in there it's just not going to be a good thing for your onion plant now it is a good idea to trim the tops on your onion seedlings that you may have in your greenhouse or your seed starting room it will help kind of toughen those up kind of help harden them off before you transplant them in the ground but once you put your onions in the ground don't trim the tops on them it's not going to make the bulb bigger if you understand how an onion grows you know you want to maximize the amount of top you have you don't want to compromise that top you want to have as much green foliage as you can get in that vegetative phase and that's what's going to give you a nice big bulb now the next piece of bad onion advice out there and this is one i've just heard of recently one of our subscribers actually informed me of this the other day she said someone was telling her that when onions start bulbing that's when you really want to pour the nitrogen to the onions and that is the farthest thing from the truth do not do that now when the onion is in the vegetative phase before this bulb starts enlarging when it's just making lots of green top here that is when you want to pour the nitrogen to it but once this onion starts bulbing here this bulb starts enlarging the ground starts kind of cracking around it you can tell when it's happening you don't want to feed them any more nitrogen at that point they're done growing top here they're devoting all their energy to enlarging this bulb you do want to pour the water to them but you certainly don't want to pour the nitrogen to them at that point so those are some examples of just some bad, awful gardening advice out there. And I'm sure I could come up with more if I pulled out my phone and started looking around on social media. But now let's talk about how good gardening advice can become bad gardening advice. And we'll start out with an example of something I do all the time around here, which is planting on double rows. Double rows allows you to really maximize the amount of groceries that you can grow in a given space but it's not gonna work great for everybody. So we grow a lot of things on double rows around here, garlic, onions, a lot of root veggies. We'll grow carrots, 
beets, parsnips on double rows, and then this year we're trying growing corn on double rows, which is working pretty well so far. But this may not work well for everybody. Now one of the reasons I like double rows so much, besides maximizing production in a given space, is the fact that once the plants get up and growing a little bit, they kind of shade out that area between the double row or inside the double row and you don't have to worry about weeds a lot. But that only works if you have relatively low weed pressure to start with. If you plant double rows in a plot or an area that has really high weed pressure, it's going to be a nightmare. Now we do have some weeds in this corn plot, but considering the number of times that we've wheel hoed or lightly cultivated this plot, our weed pressure is relatively low. If you were to plant double rows of corn like this in a plot with heavy weed pressure, you'd have quite the battle on your hands until this corn got nice and tall. So hopefully you can kind of see where I'm going here. I think planting on double rows is good gardening advice. But if you've got heavy weed pressure, if you've got a high weed seed bank and you plant on double rows, you're probably going to hate it and wish you wouldn't have. So it can quickly turn in to bad gardening advice. Now to give you a few more examples of how good gardening advice can turn into bad gardening advice, let's take for example tomatoes here for which there's plenty of good and bad gardening advice out there. Now with respect to tomatoes, one of the pieces of gardening advice you'll see out there is to put an egg in the hole beside each tomato plant and the people that like doing that claim that that's going to help out with blossom end rot and keep those little tomatoes there from having the bottom end of them being rotten when they ripen. So that can be good gardening advice. Blossom end rot is a calcium problem, and we know eggshells have plenty of calcium in them. Now the rate at which that eggshell breaks down and becomes available to the plant probably depends on how much you grind up or break up that eggshell. So that can be good gardening advice. However, as I told you when we planted these tomatoes here, I would bet that the majority of you out there already have enough calcium in your soil and so if you're getting blossom in rot it's not a calcium presence issue it's a calcium availability issue now that can get pretty complicated as far as chasing down why your plants aren't able to get that calcium from the soil into the plant and we won't get into that on this video but my point is if you've already got plenty of calcium in your soil and you're still getting blossom in rot adding an egg is not going to do anything. It's just going to add more calcium, but that might not be your problem. So if you frequently get blossom in rot, I would recommend doing a simple cheap soil test, even the little eight or $10 soil test that we can get done at our local extension office have calcium metrics on them. Do the soil test, see if you've got enough calcium in your soil. If you do, and you're still getting blossom in rot, then you can go down that rabbit hole of calcium availability and quit wasting eggs. So you can see how good gardening advice can turn into bad gardening advice. Now the next one we see a lot when people are talking about tomatoes is putting a fish in the hole or burying a fish in the hole beside a tomato plant. So last year when we had this indeterminate tomato set up in one of our other plots, we did a little experiment and I buried about a 15 or 16 inch speckled seed trout beside one of my tomato plants. And I had the same variety right next to it with no fish buried beside it. And we couldn't see any significant difference in growth or production. Now we know that broken down fish can be good food for plants. We use a lot of agri-thrive in all our garden plots and that's basically fish and corn steep liquor and we see how well our plants respond to it. But here lies the problem, or at least I think this is where the problem lies. Think about this, even if you take a relatively large fish and you were to grind it up, how much fish emulsion would you get from that fish? Probably about that much. Now, I know with our determinate plants, we have to give ours a lot more than that much fish emulsion. And so that's probably why we didn't see any significant results from our experiment last year. Maybe if we added more fish, we would have seen more significant results. The point is here, yes, a fish can be good for your garden. It's not gonna hurt anything. It's gonna add some stuff to it, but don't count on that fish alone to give your plant all the nutrients it's gonna need throughout its lifetime. 
that's when it becomes bad gardening advice so if you've got a beginner gardener out there and you tell him or her that just bury a fish beside the plant that's going to solve all your problems well it's probably not going to solve all their problems that plant's still going to need some additional nutrients so i'm not necessarily anti-fish in the hole i'm just anti-fish in the hole solving all your problems i'll give an example where we buried a good many fish just the other day so this past weekend i went and caught me a nice little mess of bass from that pond on the other side of those pine trees there and usually after cleaning the fish i'll dump the guts and stuff in my worm bin over there underneath that pecan tree but my worm bin was full so instead of just riding down the road chunking them in a ditch or the woods somewhere i figured hey we'll just bury them in this raised bed right here so i made a little trench or a pretty decent sized trench in there and i just chunked those guts in that trench and covered it up we'll throw a picture on the screen here we posted it on our facebook page so you'll believe me that there is a good bit of fish down there underneath that soil. So will those fish guts and heads benefit the soil in this raised bed here? Most certainly. Will those fish heads and guts eliminate the need for any additional fertilizer when we plant something else here? Probably not. And then the last example I'll give has to do with worms or worm casting. So I see this one all the time, claims something to the effect of using worms or worm castings in your garden is just going to transform your soil and your plants, reduce pest pressure. Lots of different claims out there about the benefits of worms and worm castings. So in this tall raised bed here, we have three nice looking grand prize squash plants. Been getting a lot of production out of these. And in the center of this bed, kind of hard to see it let me see if i can pull back there we go we have this in bed worm farm that we installed a couple months ago and the worms in there are eating up all the scraps we put in there and multiplying a lot so several weeks ago we pulled the top off that worm bin and i showed you how the roots from those squash plants were kind of crawling towards the center of the bed kind of seeking out those worms and what they were doing there so there's no doubt we're probably getting a little benefit from the vermicomposting that's going on inside this bed now are these grand prize squash plants any more beautiful or productive than the grand prize squash we've grown previously in any of our in-ground garden plots without any worm beds in place probably not i mean yeah the plants look good but squash plants down here look good this time of year before it gets too crazy hot and this variety is always nice and productive for us we're still getting some squash bug pressure even with the worm bed in place we can see some copper eggs right there so are the worms helping here i'm sure they are but we've still had to fertilize these plants it's not like the worms have completely reduced all pest pressure or reduced the need for additional fertilizations so that's another great example of how good gardening advice could become bad gardening advice if i told someone yeah go put you in a few raised beds fill them up with soil put you one of these worm beds in the middle of it and just let it rock and roll you won't have to do anything else that would probably be bad gardening advice so the moral of the story here especially with those last two examples is don't be scared to fertilize your plants i see so many gardeners online proposing ideas techniques strategy that supposedly significantly reduce the amount of fertilizer you're going to need to use or eliminate the need of fertilizer completely and most oftentimes that is not the case now yes the goal is to create healthier soil over time create a nice ecosystem in the soil that will reduce the amount of inputs you have to provide to feed your plants but even in our garden plots which have been here for a while and i think we take pretty good care of them with our cover cropping strategies and our grazing strategies and all that good stuff we still have to add fertilizer to all the plants out here we have reduced the amount of fertilizer we've had to use over the last few years especially since adding the chicken tractor but we still have to fertilize our plants now is it possible to create this kind of perfect soil ecosystem where you don't have to add any fertilizer maybe so i know there are a lot of people out there that claim they have done that and you just kind of have to take their word for it but if you're a beginner gardener and you're just starting a new garden plot or just starting some new raised beds it's going to take you years to get to that level so don't think any of these proposed solutions are going to drastically change anything for you in the first few years you're probably going to have to fertilize in the first few years until you get that nice soil ecosystem working 
And if you have any other examples of just plain bad gardening advice or examples of good gardening advice that could become bad gardening advice, please do share those with me in the comments below. So I hope you enjoyed the video today. Be sure to check out our affiliate links in the description below and go check out our website, lazydogfarm.com. And definitely check out this video right here, one we did a while back, talking about all the benefits of using a pre-plant fertilizer, why you should use a pre-plant fertilizer. This is especially helpful for you beginner gardeners who maybe don't have your soil quite where you want it yet. So check that out and we'll see you next time right here at Lazy Dog Farm.